So they're going to dive into this curly-haired segment. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to be here today to talk about this campaign because it is one of the most exciting campaigns that we've worked on in our 15-year history. And I'm going to start off by letting Minnie talk about uh, really the challenge for L'Oreal. The first challenge is always getting this to work. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to quickly talk to you about um, the key challenges that we had for Evercurl. Um, and then I have two slides that are basically saying um, similar things, but the key things to take away um, from these two slides is really to talk about how our product, Evercurl, could stand out in a very incre increasingly crowded texture hair category. Um, and we also wanted our product, Evercurl, to reach a diverse community of curly hair influencers and we also looked um, for a key partner, in this case, Texture Media, to help us in developing a 360 campaign. Um, so I'm gonna quickly talk to you about Evercurl. Um, it is a unique product um, in the L'Oreal Paris portfolio, um, just because while it is a mass consumer product, um, it doesn't appeal to everybody. Um, something that we tell a lot of the partners that come in that, um, you know, why would a girl with curly hair really want to look at messaging from straight hair products and vice versa. I have straight hair. Um, Evercurl messaging really doesn't talk to me. Um, so as um, a brand, um, we don't want to waste our message on people who simply will not look at our creative or look at our display messaging. Um, so we, one, know that um, we, our consumers um, heavily rely on salon expertise products. Um, that was something that we had to convince them that we had a product that was um, made specifically for them and was um, equally as good, or not, if not better. Um, and L'Oreal Paris really wanted to grow this um, expertise hair category and bring new consumers into the fold. So what were we looking for? We were looking for a partner that, one, had the expert knowledge in speaking to a consumer at um, a reasonable scale. Um, typically, we do work with popular uh, beauty brands, uh, beauty sites, excuse me. Um, however, we wanted to hone in on this naturally curly female consumer um, without um, sounding too cheesy. We wanted to sound knowledgeable. We wanted to own the space, and we wanted to leverage um, Texture Media's uh, ability to scale while um, speaking to them in a very relatable way. So. Uh from the very beginning, it really was a partnership. Uh, L'Oreal did their homework. They, they looked at what the curly consumer wanted. And they came to us early on with the products, um, had us try them, had us provide feedback. I mean, for us to really do the best possible job on this campaign, we had to believe in this product line. And they, they listened to, we had, we had a lot of ideas, you know, everything from a curly hair day uh, we honed it down to the things that would be the most impactful and the easiest to, to uh, execute on, looking at pre-buzz, actual launch, and something that would be sustainable. So in terms of some of the more, more impactful things that we, we know work, uh, we, we use video, blogs, blogs, you know, traditional banners and emails, but we also wanted to do some things that we'd never done before. We, um, you know, we know that our site, uh, these are very highly passionate people. They spend a billion dollars a year on hair care products alone each year. And um, they come here because they want to know what their peers have to say. Uh, and they, they're very specific. If you look at our chart, we look at nine different texture types from wavy to super coily. And a 2C wants to see what another 2C is using. And they will make purchasing decisions based on that information. And, and I can tell you, just in this room alone, I've had probably 20 conversations, very in-depth, passionate conversations about curly hair today. Because people with curly hair care a bit about these things. And they will talk about them. So we knew that reviews were, were one of the most important things that we could do. Um, and how do, we, how do we do that in a way that that kind of seeds, it has authenticity, credibility, and seeds the site with, with reviews. So we have probably 500 people who do reviews for us on a regular basis. And we send out 100 products. Um, we send out 
the full line to 100 of our top bloggers. And we did not tell them these need to be positive reviews. In fact, we feel that the, you know, the whole power of a program like this is that they are real reviews. So not all of them were positive. But before the product even launched, each product had more than 75 reviews on Naturally Curly. Uh, so as soon as the products hit the shelves, people could go and they could see what you know, this 4C loved it, this 2A, it, this product worked, but this one didn't. So it already had um, momentum going into the marketplace. We uh, sent out it, the products to our key bloggers and bloggers, and uh, you, that goes on YouTube. It also is being used on the L'Oreal site. And we have a huge sampling program. In fact, uh, two pallets of L'Oreal products uh, arrived, and they will be distributed through our Curlmart e-commerce site, which is a unique thing that we have where we can actually target you know, highly target curly products and put them in the hands of people who are already buying products. So we will be sending out uh, 100,000 samples for L'Oreal, all to curly consumers who are very likely the key demographic of people who will buy the product. Uh, we then did something kind of different. We flew in three of the top curly bloggers to New York, and we did how-to videos. Because how-to how videos are very, very, uh, I haven't been flipping here. How-to videos are very effective with our reader. They want to know exactly how to get that look. And they will watch a half-hour video. And they will, they will buy the products, and they will cocktail them to get that look. And this was, um, these were people who all had large audiences and very professionally done. Uh, these will also be running on both our sites and uh, the L'Oreal site. The reviews are currently running on the L'Oreal site as well as our site. So, um, you know, in addition to the banners, the emails, the sampling, we really create a, you know, full holistic approach that really amplified the message that this is a product that works for curly hair and is innovative. Um, so we've seen really great results. Um, I mean, the product hit mass retail shelves in January. Um, we really started promoting this heavily um, in terms of media starting in April. Um, we've seen over 50,000 video views. We've seen over uh, uh, 500 written product reviews. Um, we also had taken the um, advertorial, um, uh, behind the scenes advertorials with Glamour um, and texture media. Um, we've integrated all the seal in our print media, generating even more buzz. Um, and we've seen um, higher than average engagement on traditional digital media. Um, we've been um, looking at this campaign very, very closely. Um, I mentioned before that L'Oreal Paris works with some of the top um, popular beauty sites. And we took our theory to test um, Naturally Curly as of uh, this week has been superseding all of our benchmarks from a campaign metric um, perspective. Um, I kind of wrote down some geeky stats. Um, they have delivered over 77% um, of our total landings to the Evercurl um, site um, for L'OrealParis.com. Their landing page visit rate is 23 times our benchmark with some of their custom units delivering um, up to 112 times um, higher than our benchmark. And we're running some really engaging rich media units to kind of highlight the suite of products, um, the different uh, products matching to the different types of hair, um, curly hair that you have. And their rich media unit is delivering five times um, our campaign benchmarks. So um, we're really pleased with this integration. Um, we think that from a brand perspective and a media perspective, we have partnered with Texture Media in a very unique way. Um, we needed a unique partner that had the authority in the marketplace. Um, and we had a product that really fit with um, their, their site. And I, I guess the, uh, the true credit to the campaign is that I have all my other brands I work with telling me they want to be like Evercurl. They want a campaign like Evercurl now. <laughs> so the, the bar has been set high. Any questions? Yeah, any questions, anybody? Over there? OK, I'm coming. While I'm heading over there, I just had a question for you, Minnie. Do you see other L'Oreal brands approaching other, you know, you know your other, other brands in the same format, you know, partnering with an influencer and, and digging in? Um, I do. We, we definitely like this model. Um, 
it is, Ever, again, Evercall is really unique in the need. Um, however, for some of our other products, whether it's the cosmetics line or skincare, um, we definitely would love to use this as um, kind of a benchmark for future campaigns. Michelle, um, sure. uh, Lisa Totino, Mark USA, a full service ad agency. Um, so question I have with the texture media, is it designed as a community around a common challenge or is it more of a blogger network? Or is it a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both. Um, it started with naturallycurly.com, which really started as a hobby, uh, a group of us who had curly hair and, and really didn't see any information out there for people like us, so we created one. And it grew. Um, now between Naturally Curly and Curly Nikki, we have three million unique visitors. Curly Nikki was a blogger who started on Naturally Curly when she was transitioning from relaxed hair to her natural texture. And um, she went off on her own, and we acquired uh, Curly Nikki. But she is a, a natural hair blog. And then we also work with probably 50 to 75 bloggers and bloggers who provide reviews. We do not pay our bloggers or vloggers. Um, they're members of our community who, who want to do it and see it as a platform for elevating uh, their profile. Many of them have gone on to become very big you know, bloggers and bloggers. So, uh, but we, you know, the, the common theme is texture. We, we have a site for, for stylists called Curl Stylist. We have Curl Mart, which are which is our e-commerce site. Questions? Anybody? Have you guys also, I'm just wondering, have you worked at all with any celebrity influencers, you know, Hollywood stars, anybody who's, you know, become someone involved in your platform? We have, uh, actually, Venus Williams is a big uh, Curlmark customer, and we have a Kim, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking. We, we have a couple of people who are, we've done events with uh, natural hair meetups. I don't know if any, anyone in this room has been to one. Uh, women with curly hair like to get together with other women with curly hair and talk about their hair. <laughs> <laughs> and for those with curly hair, I'm sure that's like, oh, what a great time. But um, anyway, so we've, we've done those with different celebrities. And actually, Curly Nikki, uh, the woman who, who started the blog, she has become her you know, she has become a celebrity in her own right. She's on uh, TV on a regular basis. She just came out with a book called Better Than Good Hair. And um, she definitely has a very high profile. Any, any, anybody else? All right, well, let's have a big hand for Michelle Mignon. Uh, now we're going to uh, get a little bit more into engaging with the brand. And we're going to bring up Bailey Dreyer. Dyer, who is the brand manager of the Olay skincare business at Procter & Gamble. Um, and she, she joined P&G in 2011, where she led the campaign celebrating Olay's 60th anniversary. And she, she markets, uh, specifically works around Regenerist. So let's bring up Bailey Dyer and have a big hand for her. Keep that energy pumping through the afternoon. Hello everyone. Well, we're in the final stretch, so you guys are almost there. So a lot of energy right now. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about how we drove social engagement through Olay's 60th anniversary campaign. So Olay is one of those rare brands where women have really great affinity towards it. We have really, really loyal users. And I'm hoping by the end of this presentation you can see that by really listening to them, we were able to give them exactly what they wanted. And it wasn't free product, although they do really love that too. Um, but we gave them the opportunity and permission to brag about themselves. And it really paid off. So let me give you a little bit of context to the 60th anniversary campaign. It all started in 1952. Um, the inventor, Dr. Graham Wolf, invented for his wife the original Oil of Olay pink beauty fluid. He wanted something that felt really nice and soft and helped skin both look and act younger. Well, fast forward 60 years, and Olay has become a global brand worth over a billion dollars. So why has Olay stood the test of time? Well, one, of course, we have great technology, but also it is these very loyal women that just, you know, just absolutely love Olay. And I hear this sort of story all the time, you know, 
my mother used Olay, she had great skin, so she told me to use it. And it becomes this beauty secret that has been passed on from generation to generation. And over the years, we've just seen growth and growth and growth. However, competition has not been sitting idly by, watching us do this, they've really stepped up their game. And so in the past couple of years, this is what we've seen with our household presentation, um, penetration. Not the direction you want to see it go in. Um, so the objective of our campaign was really twofold. So as we're turning 60, we want to celebrate all of the women that got us there and that really loved the brand, but we also really need to just stop this decline in household penetration. And the way that we wanted to do that was leverage the women that love the brand and are really excited about it to get other, as, and use them as the proof that it really works to get other women excited about the brand as well. So getting women excited about skincare, it's not you know, the sexiest thing in the world all of the time, so how do you do that? And one of the very first things you learn at P&G is that at the heart of any great program is a really strong consumer insight. Unfortunately, they don't grow on trees. You can't just kind of pull them out of thin air. You have to spend time with your consumers and talk with your consumers and observe them in their environment. And then you can start to piece together, you know, what, is really, what do they really want? What's going into this consumer insight? There's a really simple framework that I like to use. I call it the insight recipe um, when trying to formulate an insight. And it begins with a truth. I want X. And there's a motivator, because it makes me feel a certain way. But then there's a tension. What is stopping me from achieving that truth? And so before I share with you an example, just kind of a quick um, show of hands, how many of you secretly love telling people how old you are? Because you think people think you're a lot younger than you really are, especially for the women out there. Anyone? You must be lay users, because that's exactly what our consumers said to us. I want people to be shocked when I tell them my age because I um, love when people think I have a beauty secret worth sharing, but I don't know the right products for me to keep my skin looking young. All right. So listening to consumers and getting their feedback, it can be very time consuming, it can be very expensive if you're spending a lot of money on market research or you're sitting in on focus groups. But I'm here to tell you right now, you can do it for free and really quickly. You can go to Facebook, read your wall posts, go to Amazon, read product reviews. This is exactly what we did to get to this insight behind the 60th campaign. Um, so these are a couple of my favorites that I pulled off of our, our Facebook wall. And what's great, so the representative stuff that we hear all the time, and what's great about them is they're completely unprompted. We don't post stuff like, tell us why you love Olay, and then it's stuff like, make sure you wear your SPF, and then they go off on these completely random tangents about their mother using LA. So I'm gonna read a couple of my favorite. Um, Laura, my mom uses it religiously and has never looked her age. She taught me good skincare. Now people can't believe I'm 42 with a 20-year-old son. I'd love to see jaws drop when I tell them my age. And then Jean, does anyone from LA read these comments? I think she'd be surprised that not only do we read them, she made it into my presentation. Um, and then Pamela, I've been an Oil of Olay user since my late 30s. I'm now 49. Don't look it, though. Here's a profile pic to see. So obviously lots of great, just so, Facebook is so rich and Amazon is so rich and any of these sites where women have the opportunity to talk about your brand, like really, really take advantage of it. So after learning from the fans, we were able to, to refine the insight down to this. So we, women secretly love to share their age if they think people will be shocked because women love to be told they look amazing for their age no matter their age. And what's especially compelling about this insight is that it, it's not obvious. You know, really there's a precedent way of thinking that it's taboo to ask women their age or they're embarrassed by it. But in fact, we found the opposite to be true. The whole campaign came together under the idea of changing lives and changing skin, and that no matter your life stage, Olay is there to transform your skin more than you ever thought possible. So Olay is the solution to that tension that I referred in the earlier slide. All right. So you know you have a good insight when you can immediately start to imagine creative ways of it coming to life. And within the digital space, Olay's um, 60th anniversary campaign 
came together via Facebook contest and sweepstakes. Um, the contest lasted through the month of October and occurred in three phases. So what we did was taking this, this um, insight, we dared women to proudly share their real age to the world in a fun and creative way. So the first couple of weeks of the campaign, they could upload a photo of themselves doing something cool to show their age. And during that time, 60 people were randomly chosen and we just gave them a lot of free Olay product as incentive to, to sign up and thank them for being loyal fans. The next part of this contest um, was the voting phase. The top 20 entries were chosen as finalists and they went up onto a gallery page where fans could then come back and vote for their favorite entries. And then at the end of that, the top three winners um, won an all-inclusive spa weekend for them and a friend to get pampered and win lots of free Olay. So um, just a quick also side note, um, ePrize was the vendor that I worked with on this and they were absolutely wonderful in helping me think through ways of how do you make this as consumer friendly and um, easy as possible and to get through it as the least number of clicks. You don't want women starting to engage and then getting confused and dropping off along the way. So visually, this is how it came to life. Um, so it lived on Facebook but it was optimized both for PC and mobile. And as we've heard today, I mean, women are spending so much time educating themselves and entertaining themselves on their phone. It's really a miss not to have a uh, mobile optimized program. So um, on your left, you see how it looked on Facebook, and then on the right was how it came together on the mobile app. Um, but if we had just posted stuff on Facebook, we simply would have just been talking to ourselves. And so, Part of the campaign was to bring new eyeballs into it, and so how do you do that? Through a combination of paid, owned, and earned media. So paid media, we had a combination of both rich and standard banner ads, and the creative copy changed throughout the contest to develop to coincide with what stage of the contest was. So in the beginning um, submission stage, we, our call to action was to go to Facebook and enter the contest. During the voting phase, we encouraged women to go and vote, and it would be directing them towards the gallery. Um, at the end of the contest, we didn't want to lose all of the momentum that we had gained behind the 60th anniversary campaign. So our final unit um, tied into our TV commercial and really talked about encouraging women to go to Olay and find the right product for them. And with that, I'm going to play the commercial that clicked Caroline in through Henry the media. began using Olay Total Effects in 2001. Since then, there's been one wedding, two kids, and 43 bottles of Olay Total Effects. So in spite of 185 tantrums, 378 pre-dawn starts, and a lot of birthdays, Caroline still looks amazing. Thanks to the trusted performance of Olay, you can challenge what's possible. 60 years, millions of women, real results. Um, women loved this ad. We also posted it on Facebook. It had 80,000 likes, which was one of like, the biggest, um, most successful Facebook posts we've ever had. Um, but this was a really great example of how it tied really nicely to into our Changing Lives, Unchanging Skin campaign. Uh, we also had Rich Media, which was directing women towards the contest. And again, the creative changed um, as the contest stages changed. Um, so the first one is during the photo submission phase, and I'm just going to read what it said. So we're proud to show off our age. Now we showed you ours. You show us yours. Show off your age. Best pick wins a spa weekend for two. And we have that media unit as well. Thank you. Go back. Perfect. So we also leveraged our own media. So on the Olay um, website, we had Olay page takeover, where we were making sure that the creative tied to the campaign itself, and that it was also directing women to the contest. We have a newsletter that goes out twice a month to over 800,000 women, um, and we made sure that was a key part of that. 
what's really is important about newsletters and email blasts is open rate, right? And so we spent a lot of time in just that subject line to make sure that it was engaging to women and, and something that they would want to open. Um, and so we little tricks like using women's name in it and mentioning that there is a prize that she could win really, really helped us with the open rates. Um, one thing that was also really great about this campaign oops, um, is that we were very agile. We were able to take early photo submissions and um, adapt them into posts to get other women to say, participate, to upload a contest. And of course, we made sure that women knew that they could participate either via their desktop or their smartphone. And finally, earned media. Um, we leverage editorial coverage and coverage from influencers and beauty bloggers. There's some, sc some screenshots here from Elle Magazine, Southern Living, Beauty Blitz. All of these places were pointing towards the Olay 60th contest and encourage women to go participate. And the results. So the 60th anniversary contest outperformed um, E-Prize benchmarks by over 200%. Um, we had over 28,000 new site visitors, over almost 6,000 um, registrants, and nearly 1,200 photo uploads, which for a photo contest was absolutely huge. Um, but, and then also what I wanted to point, so that is the winning photo. The, it's a little hard to see, but the woman raked the leaves into a 35, and women absolutely loved it. She got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of votes, so um, pretty simple way to win a spa weekend. Um, here are some other of my favorite entries. I think the 40 with the cucumber is my absolute favorite, but she wasn't our winner. Um, really, people are really creative. Um, so remember that household penetration graph I showed you guys in the beginning, pretty, pretty dismal. Um, we actually stabilized household penetration after this. Um, so the campaign ran for about six months um, behind really great consumer engagement. Um, a great commercial that, peop that people loved and that tied to this campaign and it kind of just reminded people why they fell in love with the brand in the first place. We saw a 23% lift in total effect sales during that time as well. So we did a lot of things really, really well with this. Um, we started with a great consumer insight, so women found this really relevant to them. They wanted to engage with the brand. We kept it really kind of simple and easy for her to participate. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that we could have done to have made it better as well. Um, one is making sure that we're driving participation both online and offline. This is a 360 degree campaign. We had TV, print, we had special packs in store. And it was a missed opportunity that we weren't using those vehicles to really point to the contest as well to get participation. Making the most of Facebook. You know, we work during business hours, so we're posting during business hours. But women are on Facebook after business hours, and um, Thursdays and Fridays you see a lot more traffic as well. So really being conscientious of when our consumers are most receptive to the message could really help this fly. And also using very consumer-friendly language, like winning, an event is much better than P&G, like promotion. You know, we're just talking to ourselves there. And then finally, um, increasing viral activity. Uh, you know, there's no silver bullet for making something go viral. You, if you need a really good idea that connects with people, but there are certain tricks, such as um, um, advocacy programs or referral programs where you, you win, I win, or you get a certain number of people to sign up and there's an automatic win, and that helps to spread word about your brand as well. So with that, I thank you. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and learned that by really listening to your consumers, you're able to give ex women exactly what they want. Um, Rachel Varnish is a shopper marketer at Nestle and she's responsible for Stouffer's Hot Pockets and Boutini brands and she's going to talk um, with Manuel about what they've done with this fabulous new solution. So come on up you guys. Hello. Um, well thank you all for having us today. Um, I'm looking forward to reviewing our case study that we did with Food on the Table. But just to start it off, um, at Nestle we have a lot of different brands. Um, and one of the ones that I work on is Stouffer's, really focusing on family meal occasions and how do we get them um, to purchase more often. And we have a lot of data and a lot of insights um, about it. One being that a lot of times frozen food is thought about as emergency food. But we know that about two-thirds of people who are buying our Stouffer's meals 
are buying and using them within the same week. Um, so, you know, even though the perception is that it's an emergency food, um, most people are not using it that way. Um, and then additionally, we also know that we have a lot of times um, in the category, not just in Stouffer's, that almost 80% of the people are pre-planning and creating lists and taking those to the store um, prior to getting to the store. And so our biggest challenge with Stouffer's is really trying to make it onto that grocery list prior to her getting in store, making sure that she is thinking about Stouffer's as a meal solution as she's looking at her meal planning. The other challenge that we have is that recently the frozen aisle has come under a lot of scrutiny is not, not necessarily being fresh, being full of preservatives, being full of sodium, extra fat, added fat. And when really in reality, you know, freezing is the natural preservative. And with Stouffer's itself, most of our products, in fact, many of our products um, don't have any preservatives in it. And so how do we make sure that we communicate the quality of the ingredients within our product um, with the portion control that if you look at Scratch or other restaurant cooking, our products actually do better um, on par or better than some of those alternatives. And so trying to combine the two of those, of this challenge of getting on the list and overcoming these perceptions of frozen, how do we plan on delivering a message that works for both convenience and freshness through the shopping um, process? So what we were trying to do is find the right partner um, to, to partner with and also to test different ways of how to get in. And so we looked at um, a lot of the, the conversations that we've had this, uh, the last couple of days in terms of this shopper and this mom is very mobile. Um, and we know that uh, you know, about 2 thirds or 62% of moms are using shopping apps. Um, so how do we maybe integrate or work with a shopping app to get her to change her perceptions or to get her on the list? Um, we also need it to be flexible because, you know, she's shopping and she's thinking about shopping at various different times and not necessarily always the same day and not necessarily the same, um, you know, seasonal time frame depending on whether she's going back to school or holiday planning or summer shopping. Um, and then the app needs to be comprehensive. So it needs to integrate not just a grocery shopping list but also meal planning solutions. So how do we make it easier for her to create meal plans that she can then simply add, you know, almost seamlessly, like Kelly was talking about, add to her shopping list so she can go in store and bring it in um, by also building brand awareness of our brand. And then lastly, you know, we are all trying to chase this measure, but understanding um, how it's being measured and what the effectiveness is. So that's why we decided to work with Food on the Table um, to test a campaign that would help us address our challenges as well as build brand awareness. And together, we really worked with the app to create, to create this campaign and, um, and to really see what, what food on the table and how this combined um, app could do for Stouffer. So, Manuel? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Everybody awake? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a, a long day. But um, I wanted to start uh, by, first of all, how many of you have heard about food on the table before or seen our app? So it's not that many of you. We're an emerging uh, consumer app um, on, on both the uh, iPhone and Android app stores. Um, but at the heart of what we do and food on the table and why this is such a great opportunity on working on a case like this, it really has to do with the emergence of the smartphone as something, this little supercomputer that all of us are carrying with us at all times, as you heard in this Microsoft presentation just now, what of a powerful device it is for some, a consumer to engage, get information, and use that information at the critical moments when they're making decisions. How many of you have ever uh, sat in the parking lot of a grocery store and kind of thought, what am I going to make for dinner tonight? <laughs> or being at 4 o'clock in the afternoon at your office or home or whatever and ask yourself uh, that question, right? In the past, when you came up with that question, it was very difficult for you to get the information that you needed in order to make a choice as to what you were going to do once you walked in the store. But smartphones give us an incredible wealth of powerful information as consumers to make those decisions right at the most critical moments when we want to make them, which is when I'm planning what I'm going to go buy and when I'm walking the aisles of the store and as I go and get the items um, that I'm going to purchase. 
And what that allows from a marketing perspective and why this can be so powerful, you probably heard a lot you know, uh, this last couple of days and, and, and in the recent past, the idea of digital shopper marketing. How do we reach the consumer in those key decision-making points um, at the store, equivalent to the traditional shopper marketing? What this does is that if you can get the consumer and understand and get under their skin the process that they follow for planning a trip to the store, engaging with recipes, with products, building a grocery list, using a digital grocery list when they're walking the aisles of the store, you now have a marketing opportunity of catching the consumer at the moment of intent, not after the fact. And this case study that we work together is very much about catching the consumer at the moment of intent and driving consumer influence at that key moment of intent. And that, that, this is what this is all about. So the campaign and the test that we did on this, uh, we did it for uh, actually 28 days. Um, we have about 19,000 uh, grocery stores in our database for food on the table. Um, we use a whole bunch of different tactics uh, for experimentation on this. As a matter of fact, this campaign ended um, a couple of weeks ago. One of the things that we actually did today is turn it on again. So if you download the Food on the Table app on your iPhone right now, you'll be able to see it live, and it'll be there for the next couple of days. But at the heart of everything that we do at Food on the Table from product development on forward is the idea of experimentation. So for example, when we were running um, this campaign right now, uh, you see the variations that we did here, both in messaging as well as color on the buttons. And we see constantly that there's different consumer behavior on this. Our desire to work with Stouffer's was not to provide a cookie cutter solution as we thought the problem one needed to be solved, but to go in and work with them, experiment to see what we do things that will work um, best. Um, so one of the things that we do on Foot on the Table is we're making recommendations to the consumer and influencing what they're gonna cook, what they're gonna make for dinner, how they're gonna engage with these products you know, uh, at their kitchen and at their home. And this is a perfect example of the type of activity that we do with the Stouffer's that works really, really well. So what you see on the far left is what uh, we call our discovery tab, where we're making recommendations for consumers, in this case, what we call meal pairings. So here's Crock-Pot um, with cheddar potatoes. If you notice, even at that first stage, there's no branding associated with Stouffer's there yet. We're engaging the consumer and their desire to uh, make a Crock-Pot meal, which is something that is very, very popular at the moment, we know they're looking for ease, they're looking for convenience, they're looking for a little time in the kitchen. Once you click on that, then you're presented with a light branding opportunity and the idea that that crock pot recipe that you see there uh, at the top then gets paired with the Stouffer's product, that the combined time that the consumer will need to do, either throw everything in the crock pot and when they come back and are gonna make it, within five, 10 minutes, they have a phenomenal meal at the table with great companion product and everything works out really, really great. What we saw in terms of the data on this, which is pretty phenomenal, is that if you compare this experience to what most people see today on mobile phones for mobile ads, any mobile experience that is based on advertising for a brand, the click-through rates on those are dismal. We, you know, industry standard we're saying is you know, a quarter of a percentage point on the click-through rate uh, for a mobile ad. What we saw on this is a, a click-through rates of up to 4.2%, and what we see there is a significant percentage of those consumers that are going ahead and adding uh, the Stouffer's uh, companion kind of a meal pairing product added straight into the grocery list that they're gonna use when they're walking the aisles of the store. So that idea of engaging the consumer when they need it most, the pairing happens at absolutely the perfect moment, and it's just the right moment to introduce a product um, uh, like the Stouffer's cheddar potato bake which is ideal uh, for the consumer to engage on that. A great example also uh, that we worked on with phenomenal results is the idea, on this case, we're making a recommendation for a meatloaf recipe. And note that we're making a recommendation for a recipe. This is not about the Stouffer's product yet. When the consumer has shown interest on making a meatloaf recipe, or we have a whole bunch of others in there as well, then they're presented with a recipe, but what you see there in the middle is a great big red button that says buy it pre-made. Now we're giving them the choice of engaging with a product that is gonna provide the quality, the convenience, the little time in the kitchen that the Stouffer product offers without them having to go and engage in all the steps that they have to do on the recipe. 
What we saw on something like this, which is pretty phenomenal, it varied depending on the product, but anywhere between 20 to 75% of the people that then decided to engage with this, decided to use a store for product instead of using the recipe uh, from scratch. And what's interesting about this, by the way, the most popular one was the chicken Alfredo. This can serve as a phenomenal uh, research opportunity to see how different people engage with the different store for products. Obviously, there's some reason, for some reason out there, consumers do not want to make the chicken Alfredo. <laughs> it's something that they prefer to get it pre-made and they will get the quality of the product there, while some others will have a little bit less. But theoretically, we can put a button like this on any recipe out there, so we can go back to Stouffer and say, you know, we're getting great, great click-through rate on this one, why don't we engage? You should be making this one because the consumers are saying that this is something that they want to do. Um, finally, um, we engage them by saying, uh, do you want to make a, a lasagna uh, with meat sauce? If you notice, once again, there's no branding there, but if they click on that, then we give them an opportunity to directly add the Stouffer product into uh, their meal plan and the grocery list. Once they do that, what we saw again, about a third of the people that were presented with that experience went ahead and added the Stouffer product into um, their grocery list and their meal plan directly. So by engaging the consumer at the cre critical points of influence, decision making, then you get the result for them to engage with the product add it to their grocery list, and as they're walking in the store, then you have an opportunity of doing some pretty good branding of reminding them that the product is ready and, and, and for them. I don't want to leave you without also talking about one of the things that we did, which was also one that didn't work as well, and one we're not as happy. It performed pretty well in some aspects, but not as good as we would like it to, which was the idea that it was a set of recipes um, or, or meal ideas to feel good about is what we called it, when consumers clicked on that, then they were presented with Stouffer's branding and sponsorship and a series of meals that obviously Stouffer meals that they could then go and proceed and add them directly to their meal plan. And this is one that the click-through rate and the percentage of people that added them to the grocery list was nowhere, not as good as we would like it to see or Stouffer's would like it to see. So by running all these variations on the experiment, we really found the right combination of the ones that work, the right way to engage a consumer of them, and it gives us a foundation to continue working with Stouffer and brands like Stouffer to make sure that we can go forward and deliver the consumer intent at the right moment. So really some of the takeaways that Stouffer's and, and our Nestle team took was that messaging really matters. I mean, the, the messaging that we used with Food on the Table, we, we used the same messaging that we know already resonates with our consumers and our shoppers. Um, talking about the quality of the meal, talking about the convenience and the freshness. Um, and so making sure that the shoppers are really understanding what's going into the Stouffer's products, but also marketing with them. As Manuel mentioned, you know, the, the sponsored recipes really weren't, didn't necessarily resonate with the shoppers as she was looking for her, her meals. You know, she was looking, you know, as we came out of this case study, is looking more at recipes first and then what are her solutions after that versus just general meals, uh, easy meals that she can make, and then going into Stouffer's and saying, all right, here are the, here are the meals that you can get for Stouffer's. So making sure that we're really delivering the right message in their national, natural selection process as they're going through their shopper planning and their menu planning cycle. So really making sure that we hit that. And with the experimentation that we got with Food on the Table, we were able to see that. And so, you know, our next steps in terms of what, what we're going to do is continue to work and optimize through them as how can, we, how can we build this out. We used our top four recipes, our lasagna, our chicken alfredo, our meatloaf. And what we saw was, you know, a lot of the times the, the ones that performed the best were not necessarily our lasagna that Stouffer's is known for, but some of these other recipes and being able to get those recipes out in the marketplace so that consumers and shoppers know Stouffer's does offer other recipes that may help simplify their menu planning. A couple of other key insights um, and that we saw as well, and, and to wrap this whole thing up, is this idea of, of shopping marketing, shopper marketing within a mobile context. The entrance of the smartphone into the consumer's hand inside the store really allows us to move away from cardboard shopper marketing into really dynamic experiences that target the consumer at the right moment with the right information. 
I challenge you to walk into any store today and see how many people have a smartphone in their hand and they're getting information about the products there. You will see it everywhere. We just need to design the right experiences for the consumer to engage um, the most with the product there. That's one of the things that we're doing in, in the food on the table. Finally, all of the results that you saw here, everything that we did with Stouffer's, did not have a single cent of discount to them. You can influence a consumer by getting this information at the right moment, and you do not have to depend on discounting the product to drive intent just because you're engaging them at the right moment with the right information. And that is one of the fantastic things about this opportunity because it creates a chance for getting them to add your product to the grocery list, getting them to engage with your product, but you're not depending on a deep discount for them to go and do so. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank